What's going on guys, it's Simo, and oh boy do I have a deck to show you guys. Man, can I just say I absolutely love Pac. He is one of my favorite human beings because he is able to come up with stuff like this and just see a ton of success because today we're going to be covering his 26 trap deck that he was able to just absolutely dominate with this past weekend at the Yu-Gi-Oh! Extravaganza. I believe he played in a event on day one, the Winamat, which is just a three round event, and then also in both the giant cards and got second and first place on those respective days so congratulations to him and this is the abomination that he decided to bring it to the tournament now i will have down in the description or in a pinned comment the links to both his deck profile for this deck as well as one that he did with mst tv because i think those are both very insightful i'm going to be doing more of the abridged version where i'm going to kind of go through all the cards talk about some basic interactions here but man if you are looking to just completely take down dragon link this may be a deck for you. So this is the 26 trap card abomination and uh, this deck is awesome. So as you can see, this deck is only running a total of, uh, let's be honest, three real main deck monsters here. Yeah, we do have the Eldritch traps. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Essentially, the whole goal of this deck is to be able to just control the field with all the different trap cards that you're playing, Torrential Tribute being one of the primary ones because it can wipe the board. And then you can just start swinging in with a gigantic Golden Lord and it's really difficult for your opponent to play the game. So we have the one Ecclesia and the two Golden Lord. And these are the really only monsters in the entire deck. Yes, you have the gammas but the gammas aren't even primarily used to stop your opponent during their turn you're using this on your own turn so that you're able to ensure that your trap cards resolve like say for instance scarlet so that way that it doesn't get hit by an ash blossom i guess you could also protect your spell cards as well if you're really looking to get that search in addition to that but then you can convert that gamma into something like an omega and that's another very powerful tool to have at your disposal plus you have the dogmatica punishment synergy as well so yeah just three monsters that's it this is like control at it's fine. It's just playing the most minimal amount of monsters possible, and I absolutely love it. Then for the spells, we have a blast from the past here, Card of Demise. Thank God this card's limited, because I don't think anyone misses this from Draco format. Card of Demise, the three Nadir Servant, and the three Pot of Extravagance. In this deck in particular, you don't really care about finding a specific card. You just want to get more cards, because when you're playing Control, the name of the game is Card Advantage, and you're trying to make sure that you have outs to every single thing your opponent has, and you're always in full control of the board, and you're going to have that inevitability to be able to grind them down to a halt and so that's why you see something like extravagance in this deck over something like prosperity it's also nice in this deck because you really don't care all that much about the extra deck yes there are a lot of cards that matter with punishment but what's interesting is that punishment's really all your extra deck is i guess you could maybe say gamma by extension but punishment is how you're going into your extra deck primarily and i think that's a lot of fun so that's it for the spells all these spells just draw you more cards this can be at most a plus two and then the dear servant is probably going to be a plus two most of the time let's be honest and then we have the extravagance which is just going to be a generic plus one but that's it for the spells then the traps all 26 of them and this is the highlight right here three copies of broken line now this is a card that is always teetered on competitive playability it's a counter trap and if you've never seen this before when a spell or trap card or monster effect is activated in this card's column while this card is set negate the activation and if you do destroy that card so it's an Omni negate, which is fantastic, but it does have to be in the specific column to which a card is activated. Now, going first, this may not necessarily be the best. You can put this like in the extra monster zone column, so that way you have possibly more chances to actually have some targets come out. But there are some psychological aspects to this as well. A lot of people just like the symmetry when they're playing Yu-Gi-Oh, and especially old school Yu-Gi-Oh players will tend to play their cards very symmetrically. Think of like the initial T set, right? You set a monster in the middle, you set a card face down. There's something just like very pleasing to the brain about the symmetry of that and so sometimes a lot of people just activate or set their initial cards in this the center column and so maybe playing broken line in that column is better than say playing on on one of the ends you also have to consider that most players actually use the rightmost extra monster zone column because that's just pretty much what most people are used to i would say it's just kind of feels good to put it in that side there are some arguments for like link arrows and maybe specific combos require you to use the left side but i think most people are right-handed and i think it just feels natural to kind of put it there so 
you could instinctively put it in that column, which is actually your left, remember, because it's your opponent's right, and you might have a better chance of making that broken line live. Now, the other part of this too is when you're going second, because this deck actually doesn't mind going second, because typically you can set this in a column of a monster your opponent already has face up on the field. Think about it in the instance of Dragon Link, right? Pack actually just slaughtered Dragon Link throughout the weekend and was just destroying them left and right. So if your opponent already has a board of monsters that are set up, such as Borlode Savage Dragon, Hot Red Dragon, Archfiend Abyss, you know, these cards that are going to be difficult for you to actually play through, you see where those cards are already on the field. So you can set Broken Line to that specific column. And that way you can ensure that you can negate the effect of that specific monster. And that way you can just go ahead and activate Torrential. They activate the effect of that card. You chain Broken Line and you just automatically win the game. It also allows you to play stuff like Strike and Strike can then be used for other monsters in different columns, or I guess all the columns where Broken Line would just stay by itself. So that's actually fantastic that this card is actually going to be forcing mind games. And I think moving forward, because of the success that Pack had with this specific deck, I think people are going to have to be very mindful of Broken Line. And column play was already important with cards such as Infinite and Permanence, but I think Broken Line is going to add a much bigger dynamic when it comes to how column play works. Continuing on the lawn, though, we have the three Conquistador, two Waketo, and the three Elixir. These are, I guess, technically your other engine cards that you need. And then we also have the three Dogmatica Punishment here as well. This card is so flexible in this deck because Pack is playing so many different cards in the extra deck to be able to facilitate it. It can essentially do whatever you want, right? You have the ability to pop cards with Intis. You have the ability to actually send your uh, Ariel from your app cologne that is already in the extra deck, but it's in the side deck. You have the ability to get stuff with Titanoclad. Omega can do its thing. We have the Win Pegasus at Ignister in here as well. This is an interesting one. We've seen this very rarely from time to time. If you've never seen this card before, if another card you control is destroyed by battle or an opponent's card effect while this card is on the field or in the graveyard. So think about this. You can chain this in response to something else. So that way you can ensure that this will be triggered at the end of the resolution of the chain. You can banish this card, then target one card your opponent controls, shuffle it into the deck. This is great if you're going up against anything you don't want to specifically have into the graveyard. You can shuffle stuff away back into the extra deck. That's very relevant with a Shadal deck, for example, so that way they don't get the fusion back to their hand. So this is just another toolbox in the Dogmatica Punishment package that because this deck doesn't really care about the extra deck, you can afford to play something like this and it makes your punishment have a lot more options. You also have the fact that you can play something like Tribrigade Farajit on top of it all because Farajit has an effect that if it's sent to the graveyard, it doesn't care from where, you can draw a card then place a card from your hand on the bottom of the deck. And this is good for being able to cycle cards that you don't want in your hand. You can get rid of like a dead gamma or, you know, driver if you had to draw it because we all do, you know? So having Farajit in here as well means that Punishment can either draw you a card, shuffle something away back into the deck. You have Omega, you have Titanoclad, you have Ntis, you have App Cologne. Just look at the breadth of options that you have. And that means that the card becomes much more flexible than it otherwise would when you're typically just playing the Ntis in your extra deck. So that's why this is here, of course. It's just one of the strongest trap cards in the format and has been for quite some time. Three Ice Dragons Prison because this is able to not only just get a lot of value because it's typically alongside a lot of the big power traps in this deck that are going to disrupt your opponent, not only get you a one for two, but this card will specifically out things that let's say Torrential Tribute cannot. And so this is a very good card to have for that specific reason. Solemn Strike in a very similar line to Broken Line is just able to stop monster effects. It can also stop summons. But what's important here about both Strike and Broken Line is that they're counter traps. And this means that when you flip these up, your opponent is typically not going to have a way to interact with them because there isn't really a lot of people playing spell speed three type of removal in the format unless they're specifically playing like a trap oriented deck and so by playing these your opponent's not going to be able to respond with an activation of a spell speed two monster effect like a savage dragon like a hieratic spheres like any of those different cards so as soon as your opponent does something like let's say summon a monster you flip the torrential they try to negate it you flip the strike that's it there's no messing around there's no like chain link six or any shenanigans like that it's just immediately done strike negates the effect torrential clears the board and you got yourself probably like a plus three off of the exchange and so this has always been a combo that has been very potent in rogue decks more often than not because it's very difficult for decks to actually play through something like that but the fact you're playing some very high impact cards here is fantastic and then lastly three trap trick to be able to search all of the normal traps in the deck you can search torrential you can search prison you can search punishment these are some of the strongest cards in your deck so if you want to wipe the board if you need to banish stuff that can't get torrential if you want to just have the flexibility of your entire extra deck and all the tools we discussed previously, it's like you're playing six copies of all of them and can access them at any single
single moment. So that's the 40 card lineup. I absolutely love it. The extra deck, we kind of covered most of the things in here. Last Warrior from Another Planet, as well as the Raid Raptor Ultimate Falcon are in here because of Waking the Dragon in the side deck. When you're going into games two and three, you can expect your opponent to be bringing in Harpy's Feather Duster. You can expect the Twin Twister. You can expect the Lightning Storm, maybe evenly matched. There's a lot of cards that can deal with back row focused strategies. And so we need to have cards that are going to be able to stop that because it's going to be much more prevalent in the second and third game than it was in game one. And so Waking a Dragon is a hedge against that. When it comes to something like Last Warrior specifically, this is for the combo decks. And when it comes to Ultimate Falcon, this is more for the control decks that play a lot of trap cards similar to this because they're typically not going to have an out to a 3,500 attack monster that's invincible to everything. So that's why those are in here. We have one copy of Concella Pleiades for the rank five plays you can do with stuff such as Wakero and Conquistador. It's a way to get them off the field, but actually get some value out of it instead of going into like your link monster, such as link spider. But sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And that's why we have two of those in the extra deck. We also have a copy of Nightmare Phoenix for a bit more utility, being able to pop some back row. And again, it's kind of similar to Pleiades, except it's a little bit more generic to make. And also the Blackluster Soldier, Soldier of Chaos link monster. You are playing Eldritch and typically in the Eldritch strategy, they can afford to run this just because it's pretty easy for them to make. And that way you have this other big boss monster that some decks actually have a very difficult time, if any, in some instances of actually outing this card. So it depends on the matchup specifically. But again, you can afford to run it in the extra deck. At the very least, it's just a target for extravagance on cost. And then for the side deck, we have one copy of Ariel. Ariel is really not a surprise. We've seen this teched in numerous decks up until this point, but it's really cool because it just gives some more versatility to punishment because you can dump Ap Cologne. Ap Cologne can then add the Ariel to hand. Then you can dump Ariel to the grave, trigger the Ariel, and then that will allow you to be able to banish cards out of your opponent's graveyard. So that's good. We're in a graveyard heavy format and a lot of decks rely on that. This just gives some more flexibility to that punishment. Next up, we have some cards to hedge against when we're going to games two and three. And if we are going first specifically, two copies of Anti-Spell Fragrance, and we also have three copies of Solemn Judgment and Imperial Order. Again, cards I listed previously, Lightning Storm, Twin Twister. These are all cards we have to worry about. Harpy's Feather Duster that are going to be a bad time. Now, obviously with the engine half of the deck being Eldritch, it's not that bad because because obviously if those cards get hit, they're typically going to get you some advantage back. However, losing your entire board is not fun at all. And so the Imperial Order and the Anti Spells are in here specifically for these spell cards. And then you have the Judgments that can stop stuff such as Evenly Match or Red Reboot. Those can be a lot more problematic because you may not have as many outs to deal with them. Three copies of Heavy Storm Duster. This is to deal with a lot of decks that will have any sort of back row. This is a card that's going to generate you at least a plus one in terms of card advantage because you're using one card and you're destroying two of your opponents. And a lot of the power traps in this deck are going to do something very similar to that. Look at Punishment. Look at Ice Dragon's Prison. Look at Tr Trenchel can be like a plus four sometimes, and usually it will be if you can back it up with like Broken Line or a Solemn Strike. So Heavy Storm Duster is in here just for some of those matchups where it may be more prudent to play something like this. We already covered the Waking the Dragons. Again, it's more hate for anyone trying to actually pop your back row. And there's a lot of people that are just going to blindly side into Lightning Storm or blindly side into Feather Duster if they're not main decking it, and they're going to hit Waking the Dragon and maybe just lose the game automatically. And then we get to this card. We've saved the best for last, ladies and gentlemen. Remember this card? Remember when people were so terrified of how broken this card was going to be when it first came out and then it did absolutely nothing? Well, here it is. We have Witch's Strike. So Witch's Strike is a card that if you've never seen before says, if your opponent negates the normal or special summon of a monster or the activation of a card or effect, destroy all cards your opponent controls and in their hand. What's great about this is that it's actually a normal trap. So Trap Trick can in fact search this so it's like you're playing six copies of it and think about just how easy it is to fulfill the activation of witch's strike all it says is if your opponent negates the activation of a card or effect also that includes summons either being normal or special summon but i feel like negating the activation of a card or effect is much more common think about these end boards you might come across when you're playing against something like dragon link or all these other combo decks that are these build my board style of decks you can play this in tandem with something such as solemn strike or such as broken line and you can go as soon as your opponent does anything that's going to meet that activation requirement you flip the witch's strike and even if they have something to negate the witch's strike that's why you have the solemn strike that's why you have the broken line and then not only are they going to lose every single card on their field they're also going to lose every card in their hand on top of it this is one of the most punishing cards and in this deck in particular because you're able to facilitate it and actually back it up with some spell speed three insurance that is just hilarious this is so funny and I love that this card actually has seen, you know, decent play for once. I think this is like maybe one of the first times it's ever happened. I remember when Witcher Strike first came out, there were like a very few 
few instances where people did actually play the card, but a lot of people wrote it off just because it was super unlikely to actually happen. But uh, here we are, ladies and gentlemen, 2021 Witch's Strike making an appearance. And uh, I just got to say, I love this deck. This is fantastic. I think this is something that is actually rather formidable. Like, yes, maybe there are some specific cards that could be played in the side deck to help counteract this deck a little bit better, especially if it becomes more popular as a result of it doing so well in the past extravaganza. But I still love that people are constantly coming up with new iterations of decks that have been around for over a year now and are still seeing plenty of competitive play. Trap cards are definitely in, that's for sure, and have been good for the past year or so. But it's still cool to see just a new take on something because I would say this is, while still, yes, at its core, an Eldritch deck of sorts, this is just a very interesting take on the strategy. And I really just wanted to share that with you guys today because I think this deck's really cool. I think it's a lot of fun. And, you know, if you're looking to just absolutely shaft Dragon Link for the foreseeable future, this may be something you might want to take a look at considering Pack beat almost every single Dragon Link player he played across all three days of the extravaganza. So that's going to do it for the video. I really hope you guys enjoyed. I've got links down in the description or pinned in a comment. So you can check out Pack's original profile as well as the one he did for MSC TV. Both are incredibly insightful. You can hear about some of the nuances more from him specifically. And that's really all I've got for you guys today. Let me know down in the comments what you guys think. I'd really love to hear your thoughts. We're going to be talking about some of the new legendary duelist stuff coming up later in the week because man, that's actually something I never thought I'd say I'm excited to see, but these cards are actually pretty nice. So you've got that to look forward to as well. Thank you all so much for watching the video. Be sure to like the video as always, subscribe to the channel for more amazing Yu-Gi-Oh content. And if you found this video helpful, consider supporting me on Patreon for exclusive early one day access to both the Yu-Gi-Oh progression series and the history of Yu-Gi-Oh. Thanks so much again, and we will see you next time.